can't wait for the next episode to drop. Be one of the first to listen to Ozzy Confidential a day early only on Himalaya. Go to your app store, download Himalaya. That's H I M A L A Y A, and then follow Ozzy Confidential once you're there. It wouldn't take too much to take that whole infrastructure down it, with the grids being the linchpin. All right, all right. So <laughs> I don't know how to explain this other than to explain it. I get an email. The email leads to an exchange that says, I need you to fly to this airport. I'm not going to say the airport because I've been uh, entrusted to not say the airport. Fly to the airport, await further instructions. Awaiting further instructions, get a text get a rental car, drive out two hours in the wrong direction, my fault, drive back, get to another location, get bounced to a second location, and then eventually find myself on a rural country road, stopping in front of a gate with no single markers at all. Where am I? I'm at an undisclosed mountain redoubt for James Wesley, comma, Rawls. Uh, we'll go into the name thing later. Head of a survival movement, what they call the American Redoubt, former army intelligence officer, and a guy who's got a pretty distinct stance on the coming apocalypse. All right, so uh, usually I can tell you simple things like where I am, how I got there. Can't do any of that. What I can do is tell you who I'm with. And who I'm with very specifically is a guy named James Wesley Rawls, or as his books like to call him. James Wesley, comma, Rawls. (laughs) So you have to pause before the Rawls. So first of all, why the comma in the name? Why James Wesley, comma, Rawls? Okay, the comma distinguishes between the given name and the family name. Okay. Well, mostly you've got a couple of books on the New York Times bestseller list. Yes. And and these would be? Well, the Patriots novel series, starting with Patriots and um, then Survivors and Founders. Um, What are the the books about? Yeah, the Patriots Patriots novel series is a Mm post-apocalyptic novel series set in the near future. Uh, describing a full-scale socioeconomic collapse and the adventures of a large number of people all over the country living through those turbulent years. What I find interesting about this is that it's a social collapse, but it's a socioeconomic collapse. Whereas if you had written these books 10 or 15 years earlier, 20 years earlier, it would have been a nuclear war. You know, it would be some kind of kerfuffle with another foreign national. What happens to cause a... a, a, Well, the real trigger is the U.S. national debt. Right. And the compounding interest on that debt Mm -hmm. and the growing reliance of the federal government on foreign creditors to keep financing that debt. Right now, the national debt takes up as much of the national budget as national defense. Just interest Mm -hmm. on the national debt Mm -hmm. is now nearly as much as the entire defense budget. Mm -hmm. I think the, the chances are that we are already living in what people in prepper circles refer to as a slow slide scenario. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing in our current economy Mm -hmm. is a false sense of prosperity that's driven by debt. The the level of indebtedness, public and private, has essentially tripled in the last 20 years. And it's that, it's an injection of basically cheap money or free money that's perpetuating the stock market, it's is pushing along governments at all levels, and it's providing the money for the welfare state and a lot of other things that are just chugging along. So the the premise of the novel is that foreign creditors right. at some point have a emperor sans culottes 
uh, moment and <laughs> realize they're never going to be able to pay this back. So uh, it causes a collapse in the U.S. dollar on the Forex. It causes a stock market collapse and then a full scale rout on the U.S. dollar itself, um, where it basically becomes worthless over the course of just a few weeks. It becomes worthless in an international perspective, right? And also domestically, it hyperinflates. Because of the international perspective. Right. Right. Because I, I've often thought at times that, you know, that if if the U.S., if we're going to run like a mafia crime family, at a certain point that the U.S. would say about all of its debt, yeah, you know what? I'm not paying. <laughs> but if I get about trying to pay, I'm actually not paying you, you know? So but what, as Tony Soprano once famously said, No, serious is what happens if you don't pay. Them, you got to pay. And uh, unfortunately, foreign creditors have to be paid. And if the currency unit itself right. falls apart, then you're in a heap of trouble. Okay, so this is the premise of the of this series. Mm -hmm. But you've gone beyond that, right? I mean, this is this is a case of, you know, walking it like you talk it. <laughs> That's well, I, why I, we can't tell people where we are. Right. right? I live in a very remote location right. in the inland Northwest. Mm -hmm. I can't say what state I live in. Mm -hmm. And uh, we live a very quiet life, mm -hmm. uh, surrounded by national forest mm -hmm. in a very pretty area. And we're, we homeschool our kids. We live fairly self-sufficiently. We garden for most of our produce. We hunt. We fish, we raise livestock. It's a fairly self-sufficient lifestyle. So I, I do kind of walk the walk. Um, so now, where did you go to to high school? Because I've often said that people are from where they went to high school. I went to Livermore High School in, right. in Livermore, Cal so Cal uh, Livermore, California, which is in Alameda County. Okay. Right down the road from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Right. My dad worked at the lab. Most of the kids I grew up with worked at the lab. Right. Their, their parents worked at the lab. And it was an interesting place to grow up because we had the largest number of bomb shelters per capita sure. of any city in the United States. Yeah. And all the kids I grew up with were either the children of people who designed nuclear weapons or worked in other programs at Lawrence Labs. Yeah. My dad was a nuclear uh -huh. um, program manager. Right. Uh, in B division of the of lab, he actually worked with cyclotrons and linear accelerators, and uh, worked in experimental physics at in they call pure research. Applied physics at the laboratory means you're designing nuclear weapons. Right, right, right. So now, did this influence your decision at all to go into the military? My dad had been an Air Force instructor pilot in uh, T-33s back in the 1950s, back Korean War vintage. So I thought, well, I'll go in the Army. Yeah. Intelligence sounded interesting. I had an interest in foreign language, an interest in you know foreign affairs, and uh, the intelligence field really gave me a chance to delve into that. I was involved with some unclassified country studies. Right. Somebody might deduce from given your your initial professional calling that your mise en scène uh, is informed in a way that it wouldn't be if, say, I was doing it. Yeah, I think it gave me a, a different perspective. Mm -hmm. um, the country studies I was involved in, one of the things we were looking at was economic stability. Mm -hmm. After doing all those country studies on Eastern Europe and, and, and watching... Uh, you know, hyperinflation with the replacement of the shekel by the new Israeli shekel, knocking three zeros off the currency and having read about the same thing happening in Greece. And uh, later on, I saw the same thing happen in Zimbabwe. Uh, it, that kind of perspective made me realize that we're standing on pretty uncertain ground here in the United States with the level of indebtedness that we have. The podcast world is growing bigger every day, and Himalaya wants to help you navigate it. Himalaya is a brand new podcast app where you can find every single podcast you love and some future faves. Whether you're a podcaster or a fan, Himalaya's got your back. Discover personally curated playlists and show your favorite podcasters some love with Himalaya's tip jaw. It's free, and it's the easiest to use, and they're adding cool new features every day. Go to your app store, download Himalaya. That's H-I-M-A-L-A-Y-A. -A -A. And don't forget to follow Ozzy Confidential once you're there. It does seem like if Trump's objective is to reduce the size of the deficit, the tax, the corporate tax cuts 
though they might have enlivened business, seems to... They're not helping. <laughs> That's where I'm They're not helping with the bottom line. And unfortunately, as you mentioned, the long-term obligations, right. things like Social Security and military pensions, federal government pensions, those long-term obligations, mm -hmm. don't, they are not even figured in the $21 trillion national debt. Right. If you count the, those long-term unfunded obligations right. into the debt, it's actually more like a $60 trillion debt, which is three times the gross national product. So what happened to these other countries, Zimb the countries you named, Zimbabwe, um, you know, well, in Israel, Greece, Israel? Yeah, what yeah. happened to these in, countries? In Greece and Israel, they were able to kind of dig themselves out of the hole because they had strong economies. Right. In the case of Zimbabwe, yeah. where you had Comrade Mugabe who was, and his cronies who were systematically looting the country, right. there was no way out. They, they had to... They basically destroyed the dollar. They went all the way up to printing $100 trillion bills, mm -hmm. and then they completely repudiated them. And now they use the South African rand in U.S. dollars. Okay, so that's an economic collapse, but that's not a socio collapse, right? Right. The logical jump in a modern technologically connected society is that we have a society with incredibly long chains of supply, a relatively fragile power grid infrastructure. We have three grids, the Western grid, the Eastern grid, and the Texas grid. And it wouldn't take too much to take that whole infrastructure down it, with the grids being the linchpin. And what I posited in the novel series was that if you have an economic collapse and then you have rioting in the big cities, all those nuclear power plants have to go offline. They have to scram the piles of those plants and shut those plants down if they don't have a certain level of staffing by law. If you don't have people to, to handle the equipment, it's not going to happen. You mentioned three countries that had economic collapse but they didn't have full-scale riots. Why, why, why here in America? It's awfully easy to get along with what you've never had. In a country like Zimbabwe, people were already used to living at, a, at an agrarian level. In America, we are so far removed from our agrarian ancestors, it's not even funny. Uh, in the 1930s, when they had the depression in the 1930s, the, the society still held together yeah. because 20% of the families were still living off the land. They were still actively engaged in farming, mm -hmm. fishing, ranching, mm -hmm. mining. They were, they were connected to the land. And today, only 1% of the population is feeding the other 99%. Yeah. So it wouldn't take very much disruption yeah. to basically break the food chain. And because I'm in an isolated area that's so far removed from major metropolitan areas, I think that the majority of the problems are going to be in those major metro areas. Since we're more than a tank of gas away from the nearest major metro area, I don't think we're going to see many problems here. Yeah. The grid may be down, although thankfully in the Northern Rockies, most of our power is it's hydroelectric. In fact, we actually export power. So now, the, did that inform your decision? Did you? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. The All grid right. is going to be reconstituted anywhere. Right. It'll be in hydroelectric areas right. first. Right. Now you've fashioned it in a very real way a, a lifestyle, but you also have done something that you know you, you had children, and these are these are kind of. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, what do you call them? Uh, free radicals. Kids, they, they <laughs> decide what they're going to do. They're going to, you know, and yeah. get to a certain point. They're free range kids. They're free range kids. So now, have they have they followed suit or are they? Yeah, I most mean, of them are prepper oriented. Okay, and but they but some of them are in cities. Or am I right? right? Yeah. Well, one one is living in a major city in right. in Asia right now. All right. Okay. So, but that was a you know a choice to to pursue a opportunity mm -hmm. to be a missionary. Mm -hmm. So. It's it, there's choices and trade offs for everyone. Mm. I'm pleased to see though that the majority of my kids have pretty well followed in my footsteps. Mm -hmm. They're all very pro gun, very pro preparedness, and basically pro self sufficiency in terms of the way they you know they all have an interest in gardening and mm -hmm. and you know raising livestock that sort of thing. How does how does I mean if you live in the city. You, you have an interest, but you can't. I can't well, keep there, you know, e even if you live, even in an apartment, you can have a window box garden or, and grow sprouts. 
And even someone living in a suburban house mm -hmm. on a quarter acre lot mm -hmm. can have a pretty efficient vegetable garden. Now, now are these and keep uh, rabbits or chickens? Right. Are these are these ideas formed in a much more major way as a result of having been an intelligence officer, or are they informed by? Um, religion, or or is it, well, is it part, they, partly religion? Uh, uh, you know, because I, you know, I take the Old Testament pretty seriously, right. and you know, man's supposed to care for his own family and right. provide for his family. Uh, but I think more of it, more than my intelligence background, it goes back to the pioneering side of my family. Mm -hmm. uh, we settled in a remote area. It's even still kind of remote. The Anderson Valley of uh, Mendocino, Mendocino County, California, uh, in the 1850s, and they had a 6,000 acre sheep ranch and did just about everything themselves. Mm -hmm. The only thing they would buy when they would s sell their wool each year and sell mutton was salt, sugar, and tea. That's the only thing they had to buy. Everything else they produced for themselves. But they 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 were not similarly informed by this idea that it was necessary to do this. No, it was just, that was just the, okay. the culture at the time. Right. They weren't worried about the fragility of society like right. I am. Right, right. But the, the same, right. the same self-sufficient mindset, right. I think, really pervades every cell of my body. Right. But I, but I guess I'm wondering, is this driven by, you know, end time signals or, 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 or well, not, less that and more that, look, I've actually spent my time analyzing what happens to states that are failing and that fail, and I'm seeing signs, and I got to respond to these. Yes, signs. it's definitely more the latter than the former. Okay, because I wonder. I mean, on the one hand, you might say there. Were, I just did a piece on the 1977 blackout in New York, and the, the point that I want people to get to is, you know, what happened in July 23rd, 1977? The lights went out. That's it. <laughs> no, actually, people were fairly civil. No, no, they were civil in 1965. The first one, oh, okay. it was 60. civil. Fight. There were two. There, there yeah. were three. There was one before 77, and there was one after 77. Okay. 77 was a perfect storm where the Vietnam War had ended a few years earlier. Ah, okay. The vets were coming back to the city, suffering from what we didn't know was PTSD at the time. Nixon resigned a few years earlier. Ford had just told New York City to drop dead. I'm not, you're, you're going to bankrupt yourself. Um, and it was... And, and interest rates were still sky high. Yes. And so the lights went out. I was watching Beretta at the time. <laughs> I remember this, and I kind of went, and went up. my mom said, no, you better come back in the house. And people went, over 4,000 people were arrested, over 500 cops were hurt. I didn't I, realize it was that bad in I have, 77. I have a special, uh, uh, no, a guy I know who's uh, another intelligence guy, special forces guy, who then contracts out to like Blackwater, and he got called to New Orleans after Katrina, uh, property protection. And he was like, organized gangs, you know, they show you on the news people stealing pampers. That's not it. The banks were, people came in with forklifts. Uh, uh, those big auto transports were going up to dealerships. And there were guys, with, you know, we pull up, what are you doing? The guys pull guns on us, we pull guns on them. And our men, wow. it's a, you know, so it's clear that the people... I mean, he wasn't going to say this, and I'm not going to say it now, but all of, they say, you know, how much money was lost during the right. I think a lot of that was people seeing an opportunity and embracing it. It wouldn't take too much to cause a total break. And if, if we get to the point where the power grids go down mm -hmm. and don't come back up for two months, especially if it happens in the winter, I'm not sure if they're going to come back up for years. And that was the basic scenario for Patriots. So now, so you've you got the book out, but then you also, in, in a parallel path to that, you start a, a website. Right. I did a, uh, started a blog in 2005 right. called Survival Blog. It's, it's a very popular blog on family preparedness. And we cover pretty much every aspect of preparedness, whether it's food storage, communications equipment, first aid, water filtration, mm -hmm. gardening, livestock, heating your own home with firewood, all those sort of topics. You know, I made the break to the hinter boonies, but I was only able to do that because I was self-employed. And unfortunately, most people can't do that. And a lot of what I'm doing in Survival Blog is coaching people 
on how they can survive in the suburbs. And that's where the majority of my readership still is. Mm -hmm. A lot of people want to move to the inland Northwest region, that merit, the area that I refer to as the American Redoubt, which consists of Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, and the eastern half of Washington and the eastern half of Oregon. Mm -hmm. That's the area that I consider the most survivable. Why? Because it's all on hydropower and the population density is incredibly light. Those are the two main factors. That and, you know, there's quite a bit of agriculture, farming, ranching, mining. I think that the chances of that region pulling through are better than just about anywhere else in the lower 48 states. What about the world? Worldwide? Oh, boy. There, I think the Pacific Island nations would probably have the best chance to reverting to at least the lightly populated islands would have the best chance to revert to traditional culture. So we're talking like Rarotonga? Or, yeah, or, yeah, places like Vanuatu and yeah. uh, places like that, where people are used to growing poi, yeah. raising pigs and fishing. They all still do it, yeah. at least the majority of them, yeah. or at least half their cousins do. Yeah. So their chances of reverting to that level of technology are fairly high. Yeah. And from a multi-generational standpoint, if we had, if we literally go into a second dark age, I think that would actually be an even safer place than right here. Stitch Fix is an online personal styling service that finds and delivers clothes, shoes, and accessories to fit your body, budget, and lifestyle. Just go to stitchfix.com slash Ozzy, that's O-Z-Y, and tell them your sizes, what styles you like, and how much you want to spend on each item. You'll be paired with your very own personal stylist who will handpick five items to send right to your door. Then you try them on, pay only for what you love, and return the rest. Shipping exchanges and returns? Always free. There's no subscription required. You can sign up to receive scheduled shipments or get your fix whenever you want. Stitch Fix's styling fee is only $20, which is applied toward anything you keep from your shipment. Get started now at stitchfix.com slash OZY and you'll get an extra 25% off when you keep all five items in your box. That's stitchfix.com slash Ozzy to get started today. Stitchfix.com slash OZY. Got your degree in journalism. So you're paying attention and reading the newspapers and processing this. Uh, how much, how, how does class factor into this? Do you see this being primarily a class struggle? It, it, it may, it may, mainly class, because uh -huh. I, I don't believe in the whole concept of race. Yeah, There's yeah. only one race, the human race. Yeah, yeah. Um, from a class standpoint, the, there is un, unfortunately now a dependent class, and it, those are people of all different skin tones who are dependent on the system, and a lot of them don't even have real jobs. Mm -hmm. That level of dependency is a huge risk. The majority of it, though, I think is a distinct difference in, the, in people's outlook on the world. Mm -hmm. People are either directed toward hearth and home and the land, or they're technological or urbanite types who think in abstract terms like the funny money that we carry around in our wallets. And if, if you have a whole group and it's the majority of your population who lives at that level of abstraction and that level of, level of distance away from the land, mm -hmm. those are the people who are at greatest risk. And those are the people that I have to say, I want to be the farthest away from. Mm -hmm. I want to be living in the country with people who live fairly close to the land. I think those are the, the people I'll have the best chance of pulling through with. Right, because they're also producing. They're producers, right. They're also self-sufficient. Relatively, yes. Right, right. And at least if, there, if anyone has a chance of reverting mm -hmm. to 19th century level technology, mm -hmm. it's probably my neighbors. No, it isn't. I've got a friend who's a, a Trump, uh, who's a Trump uh, adherent. And he says, you know, one thing I really hate, and we're getting the huge arguments over, not politics, the commute lane. <laughs> and he's like, I'm going to drive in the commute lane, whatever, I'll pay. And I go, no, 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 you, you don't understand. 
if everybody does what you do, that commute lane is just another lane. Right. If we are going to return to a closer relationship to the land, there's clearly that, that in, in a nation of 350 million people, that's it's what I'm getting at. difficult. Yeah. But I know that less than two or three percent of the population mm-hmm. is even going to have an interest in getting back to the land. How do you know this? Well, just look at the demographics. The cities are getting bigger. The plain states like the Dakotas are actually depopulating. So is Wyoming. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. People are still, the general trend is still toward congregating in the big cities. Why? Because that's where the money is. And we, we have a system that's dollar driven and that has a level of technological sophistication that's quite appealing to people because that's, that's where the high paying jobs are. That's where the opportunity for advancement is. That's where the, the cultural centers are. And yet your sons found their spouses, not here, but they had to go to large centers, right? Well, um, in the case of, of one of my children, mm-hmm. uh, he, yeah, he, he met her at college. Yeah. But she also ha- happened to come from a prepper family. And she also was homeschooled. Interesting. Yeah. So they had a lot in common. So they gravitated together. Mm -hmm. Their goal is to, in the long run, end up living as far from the big city as they can. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I I feel comfortable letting the government off the hook. I I still hold out some hope Mm -hmm. for the political process. Mm -hmm. And it's just difficult, though, in the 21st century to objectively look at what's going on and say, the chances are better than not that things are going to get, that things are going to improve. Mm-hmm. I don't think we're on that side of the equation. What could or should the average person do who's listening in order to guarantee their continued safety in the future? There is no guarantee, but there is an actuarial equation. Which is? And that is that from an actuarial standpoint, if I was an insurance actuary, I would say that if I was writing a policy for socioeconomic collapse, that policy would be really expensive for people who live in the cities and really inexpensive for people in the low risk groups. And that would be the people who live out in the hinter boonies. Mm -hmm. So I would recommend that if people have the opportunity, if they're either at or near retirement age, or if they're self-employed, or if they can develop a home-based business and become self-employed, mm. that they do that. And they develop not one, but two or three revenue streams. So that if you're self-employed, you would run two or three different businesses mm. so that you could pull through all sorts of different economic times. And that would be your ticket to move to the boonies mm. and for most people, even those who hold fairly large mortgages, cashing out of a house in the big city would buy a much larger house with a barn, with a greenhouse on large acreage where they can keep livestock right. in the country. Well, now this doesn't explain, though, why you homeschooled the kids. That was more of a philosophical mm-hmm. and religious thing. Mm-hmm. Although, just from a you know purely empirical standpoint, mm-hmm. looking at test scores declining and then having them renorm the tests mul- multiple times mm-hmm. indicates to me that the, the public schools are a lost cause. And I think that people, if they're serious about educating their children, should either educate them themselves or they should have them in private schools. Yep. Yeah, and I think that if people like Donald Trump were serious mm-hmm they would have tuition tax credits that would allow people to take their kids out of public schools, put them in private schools. Private private schools would then flourish. Mm -hmm. And eventually you could eliminate the whole public school system. Yeah. Then where do poor people get their kids educated? Well, with tuition tax credits, they can can go to private schools too. That's compelling. It's a compelling vision of the future. But, you know, from the 50s through now, and so far as I've been paying attention... There's always been a specific and particular vision of the future that is very much like yours. When people sure, if you go back to the bomb bomb shelter era of the early '60s, right. a lot of those people have the same outlook that I do, yep. and they had a lot of the same goals, like food storage and mm-hmm. self sufficiency, and moving to lightly populated areas. In those days, they were worried about you know being out of fallout, fallout areas, but the same kind of mentality exists. And I actually would like nothing better. Mm-hmm. 
than to die peacefully in my bed and not having lived through a socioeconomic collapse, be able to say to myself, I lived a good life. I raised my children where I wanted to on my own terms, lived the lifestyle I wanted, and I'm glad nothing happened. And how old are you now? I'm now 58 years old. Okay. So, so far, so good. So, so far, so, so good. <laughs> and, you know, back in the 1980s, yeah. I can remember, um, or even the 70s, I can remember late 70s, people were saying, no trillion dollar national debt. Remember, there was a, you know, if, if we reach a $1 trillion level of, of de debt, indebtedness for the federal government, our society is going to collapse. Mm. Well, now we're at 21 trillion and counting. Things are hanging in there. I remember the drill baby drill thing, the Sarah Palin drill baby, and the concerns about the pipeline, oil spills. I mean, well, yeah, there's a, every equ equation is going to have its detracting factors. Right, right, right. But, you know, I'm a big believer in American ingenuity, and we may be able to power through this. We may not have a socioeconomic collapse, mm -hmm. but even if there's only a 5% chance of, a, of socioeconomic collapse, mm -hmm. I don't want to be the guy who's the third guy in line. I don't want to be the guy who's sitting behind all the traffic trying to leave the big cities when everything falls apart. I want to be the guy who's already living out with it. My, my chances of, of pulling through will be that much higher. So, uh, you convinced? You ready to join the movement? You know, I'm such an easy mark. I got to work on it because I am. <laughs> Sorry, but 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 not quite yet. Next week, next week we have uh, Renee Wu, born in Taiwan, got a PhD in chemistry, worked at a major high-tech corporation, doing stuff that it would roast your brain to, to, to think about. One day stood up at work, said, fuck this, I'm out, became a world champion pole dancer. Ha! I love it. Next up on Ozzy Confidential. Ozzy Confidential is produced by who else? Me, Eugene S. Robinson, and executive produced by Robert Kulos. And this episode was sound designed, edited, and mixed by Jamie Kahn and Nick Johnson. For more Ozzy Confidential, check us out on Ozzy.com. That's O-Z-Y.com slash confidential. We publish editorial companion articles on Ozzy and the photos, videos for every single story. So to check them out, go to Ozzy.com slash confidential. That's O-Z-Y.com slash confidential. And you can see behind the scenes. You can learn more about the stories we tell and even become an official OC, where you'll be kept uh, uh, in the know on all things Aussie Confidential. And if you want to get in touch with us, learn more, or just generally vent, hit us up at uh, confidential at Aussie.com. We'll send over a t-shirt if we dig what you got to say, good, bad, or ugly, or maybe we'll get too lazy to do any of that. Thanks! <laughs>